Hi, I am Eva Goetz from University of Bergen in Norway. And I am here together with Professor Isabella Sudano from the University of Zurich. And we would like to discuss sex differences in hypertension with our guest, Professor Renata Sifkova, who is head of the uh, cardiovascular department at the Tomaya Hospital in Prague and professor at the uh, Charles I University in Prague. So we are delighted to have you here, Renata. Can you tell me, why did you become interested in sex differences in hypertension? Uh, it's a good question, but I think the main reason why I became interested in this issue is that this was mainly overlooked, you know. So it's very difficult to find something new and surprisingly, you know, sex differences in hypertension, in my opinion, are largely overlooked. As you know, women are underrepresented in all um, large clinical trials. And, you know, I'm really embarrassed when I see that women are listed among special populations. What does it mean we are 52% of the population listed as special population, I don't think this is fair. Thank you. And um, I, th I think we have a lot of interesting topic to discuss today. And when I think about hypertension, I always surprise has a, a cardiovascular disease, which is responsible for large, um, have a large impact on cardiovascular disease, morbidity and mortality, and how late the diagnosis sometimes is, and sometimes means quite often, unfortunately. Uh, what are the main challenges in your mind um, for an early diagnosis hmm. of hypertension? So I, I think the problem with hypertension in women is that even if it's diagnosed, it's left untreated because it's considered to be associated with lower risk, which is actually not true. You know, this is a wrong perception of many physicians. And it's not only the case of hypertension, the same could be applied to lipids, because we know from your aspire uh, trial that women are basically uh, less intensively treated than men because the perception of cardiovascular risk is wrong. When you look at the uh, European guidelines, they actually recommend uh, blood pressure uh, to be regularly followed up and measured both in women and men above the age of 18. So based on what you are uh, saying, to what extent do you think that this is followed up uh, around in European countries? You know, in my opinion, I think it's mostly being followed. But the problem is that if a blood pressure uh, level, if the numbers are recording, no action follows. So it's just being recorded. It might be, um, let's say, in agreement with hypertension. So what should be done is that the diagnosis has to be verified. And this is very often not the case. So there is no verification of the first uh, increased blood pressure measurement. Second, even if it's verified and medica antihypertensive medication is prescribed, we know that a large number of patients will stop the medication within the first year. So there is basically absolutely poor education because women, but this also applies to men, are not educated, they are not told that antihypertensive medication is in most cases the medication until the end of their life. So 
in my opinion, it's a matter of organization. You know, you shouldn't tell the patient, please come back. I think you have to give him certain date and time to show up. And if they do not show up, they have to be called by a nurse asking them why they didn't show up, you know. So basically, they should be followed and they must have uh, regular uh, dates. Another problem is uh, very often when the medication is initiated, uh, the patients get only one pack, which means they have to come back very often, let's say, even more frequently uh, than once a month. And uh, this will definitely not improve the adherence. So I think uh, the patient has to collaborate, has to cooperate on this issue. So we should teach them on how to measure blood pressure, the home blood pressure measurement. The patient has to do it in a proper way, should keep the records about it, bring the records with him or her uh, to our offices. And we should then check it with the values which we measure in our office or with 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So definitely it's important to establish a friendly and cooperative relationship with the patient. I can subscribe every word you told. I think it's so important to have the patient on board. And uh, the problem with the follow-up is, I think, across all European country, a very big, a big problem. And do you think there are some hypertensive patients who could profit more than other? Because we know follow-up is important for every hypertensive patient. But maybe there are some patients will profit more by a close follow-up. Um, I definitely think that this is the case of both postmenopausal women, because um, we should tell women that menopause is a risk period for them where everything gets deteriorated. They usually gain weight, blood pressure goes up, there is a deterioration of lipids. So altogether, there is an increase in the cardiovascular risk. So a regular checkup around the menopause uh, should be obligatory uh, in each GP's office. And based on that, there should be a risk stratification and a regular follow-up. Another problem which I see is a group of women who have hypertension in pregnancy and in whom mostly no follow-up is being established. And again, this is a high-risk group of patients where we know that later in life, they have an increased risk to develop hypertension. This risk is increased at least twice in many studies, three times compared to those who are normal tensives in uh, pregnancy then they have an increased risk of developing coronary heart disease, heart failure, stroke, and even thromboembolic disease. So they should be uh, regularly followed up and their risk factors should be treated. Thank you. I think the very important point. Maybe we can um, change the topic. Um, we, we know that young women and premenopausal women have usually lower level, lower blood pressure level than men in the same age. But it seems that the cardiovascular risk starts to rise at this lower level. And I think that's a quite provocative question, but do you think we need to think about different threshold for treating men and women? Um. We know that there are now several observational studies which show that the risk uh, 
associated with blood pressure starts at lower levels in women than in men. So unfortunately, these are only observational studies, but I think we should um, see it seriously. What we would need would be an interventional trial where we should test the um, threshold levels uh, for initiating blood pressure uh, in women. But these days uh, to conduct any clinical trial in hypertension is very difficult and I would say almost impossible because uh, we are losing uh, the support of uh, pharma companies. You know, the gold age for large clinical trials in hypertension was 20 years ago and now it's, it's very difficult in hypertension because we have basically no new substances, you know. On the other hand, we have five classes of antihypertensive drugs, which are all very suitable to initiate uh, drug treatment and to maintain drug treatment. But the problem is that in the daily practice, this is not properly used because um, most of the patients need a combination of therapy uh, many of them need a combination of three or more drugs. And this is very often not the case. We can make the uh, scheme uh, of treatment uh, um, much easier for the patients today because uh, we have a fixed combination. So we can uh, get a pill with three substances. And this makes the adherence um, um, greater. Uh, so, Renata, uh, an emerging problem is the uh, lower control rate of uh, blood pressure in older women. So, uh, why are we experiencing this? And what about the role of adherence and persistence in blood pressure control or what we observe? So in my opinion, there are at least two reasons for that. Uh, first, many elderly women may have um, unrecognized depression. And of course, um, depression is associated with low adherence to any drugs, including antihypertensive medication. And second, in general, women experience more side effects to antihypertensive drugs. So that's why they may stop uh, their medication because of edemas due to calcium channel blockers, because of dry calf due to AC inhibitors, they may also develop more frequently hyponatremia or hypokalemia uh, because of taking uh, diuretics. And these are all factors which are definitely associated uh, with uh, low adherence. And last but not least, you know, they might be also treated less aggressively than men again because the perception of physicians, of physicians is that they are at lower risk, which is definitely not true for those who are um, uh, postmenopausal, because these women are at high cardiovascular risk. So they might be, they might be treated less aggressively uh, than men. So basically, uh, physicians are also partly responsible because they don't act properly. It's nihilism what they do in uh, many cases. So we, we previously had Professor Juan Tamargo on this podcast series, and we came to discuss with him also that we recommend the same dosages of beta blockers, of um, diuretics, or, and also of uh, ACE inhibitors. Although we know that uh, 
maybe uh, women are more sensitive to uh, to these drugs and experience larger effects on uh, the blood pressure on these uh, drugs. So what would be your recommendation there? Uh, do we know if we, sh we should use the same dosages in women and men with hypertension or should we differentiate this? I think it's a good question and I would say the fair answer is we don't know because again in my opinion in most of the clinical trials the same doses of antihypertensive drugs were tested in men and women. And definitely, in most cases, women have a lower body weight. We know, for example, from trials with thrombolytics that women experience, experience more bleeding because they got the same dose as men but had a lower body weight. So it may well be that the same doses in women are simply associated with uh, more side effects. In some cases, they may also have uh, a too uh, big um, antihypertensive response. In other words, uh, too much blood pressure lowering, which may not be uh, well tolerated by the patients. And that's also a reason why they may stop medication. So uh, I think this is, again, an issue which has to be tested. Unfortunately, you know, there was a large meta-analysis uh, of clinical trials which looked at safety and efficacy of uh, various antihypertensive drugs with the specific issue looking at the differences between men and women. And the conclusion was that there seemed to be no differences in safety and efficacy um, in uh, antihypertensive drugs. Yes, yes. Now, I, I quite understand that this is not really explored well. And we came back to it that this time also, as we did in our previous discussion. So, Isabella, over to you. Thank you, Eva. I think we have a great discussion. I thank you, Renata and Eva, for the great discussion. Um, we were talking about diagnosis and we underlined as women, even if we get an early diagnosis, remain more commonly untreated or are treated less aggressively than men. And therefore they stay at the highest cardiovascular risk. And especially in postmenopausal women, as well as women who had pregnant, uh, um, hypertension in pregnancy, it's really, really important to have a close follow-up and a great collaboration with the patient. We underlined the importance of adherence and persistent to antihypertensive therapy and has in men and women, side effect and depression could be factor limiting adherence. Also, um, telling us that it's really important to talk to the patient, to have them on board, to have a real uh, good control of our blood pressure, and then to have an eye on women, because as Renata said, more and more often they have a less good control blood pressure than men. So I thank you all for the discussion and all the people listening, and I wish you a very nice evening.